Good morning and good afternoon. A very warm welcome. I'm glad you could make it here for HYCM's live market analysis with myself, uh, Giles Cochrane, Chief Currency Analyst. Uh, very good to be here with you all. Special uh, welcome to you, particularly if this is your first time here at the webinar. Uh, we have two significant central bank meetings this week, the Reserve Bank of Australia, I'll be going into that in some detail, and the Bank of England on Thursday. So there'll be two major events we'll be covering. Uh, don't forget, as I go through different entries, exits, different instruments for trading, remember that this is not from an education, this is from an educational perspective. This is not a signal trading service. So the idea of these webinars is not that I tell you to trade this or that, but the idea is you look over my shoulder, someone with a professional trading background, and you see how I go about understanding uh, market dynamics. So uh, that's the way that that works. Um, a very uh, good well, warm welcome. Don't forget we've got a question and answer, answer panel. So if you have any questions during the webinar, do put it in the questions or the chat box, and I will get to that at the end of the webinar. So don't miss out on those opportunities to ask questions. Remember, the only silly question is the question that you didn't ask. Uh, these are the key events we'll be looking at. We've got some US data in focus, and we'll just run through what we learned from the last FOMC meeting and how that impacts the dollar. We'll also be looking at how to trade the RBA rate statement and the Bank of England rate statement. We'll also be looking at gold, I'll explain what's going on with gold, as well as the Aussie New Zealand dollar, potentially Australian dollar CAD as a sell idea. Also looking at the pound yen ahead of the Bank of England meeting. So quite a lot to cover. Uh, exciting uh, to have a bit of uh, central bank action this week. So we could see some volatility as we head into this sleepy summer month. So without further ado, we're going to go over to the main charts. I'm just going to change my screen. And then we'll, there we go, super, right. So first of all, let's look at the US dollar. Now this is a big week for the US dollar. On Later on today, we have, let me just show you, you have, we have the ISM manufacturing uh, PMI data uh, coming up uh, uh, shortly at the top of the hour. And we have the RBA rate statement coming up. So for the dollar, we've got ISM PMIs, You've got ADP jobs number on Wednesday, as long as services PMI, and we also have non-farm payroll on Friday. So this is a big week for the dollar, and let me explain what we're doing here. Now, if you look at the dollar index, this is if you're new to trade, remember the dollar influences the other major pairs. So when we see the dollar strong, that means that other currency pairs tend to be weaker against the dollar. So the dollar influences all the majors, Aussie, Euro, Pound, New Zealand, US dollar. Now, the dollar at the moment has been ripping higher after that June Federal Reserve interest rate meeting. The reason the dollar rose was because of the FOMC, the Federal Reserve, on their dot plot projection saw sooner interest rate hikes coming. That led to a strong bid into the dollar. Now, heading into the last FOMC rate decision at the end of July, the dollar moved up into that 93 resistance, then sold off. Why? Because Jerome Powell didn't give any hints of bond tapering, and he didn't give any hints that the Fed will be moving quicker than the market was expecting. So the market was kind of gearing itself up, you can see here, to a bullish and to a more hawkish FOMC. Uh, Jerome Powell wasn't necessarily dovish, but he wasn't overtly hawkish. So this allowed the dollar to fall back into this key support level that we highlighted here. Now, with the dollar falling into that support level, the dollar is now stuck between that 93, 92 range. Now, the path of the dollar is gonna be important and likely to be determined this week by this incoming economic data from the, the ISM manufacturing, the ADP jobs, services PMI, and the non-farm payroll. Now remember, if those data points surprise to the upside, so for instance, let's give an example. So today, the expectations is for the forecast to come at 60.8, and if the ISM data comes in much firmer than expected, say it comes in like, you know, 62, 63, then we'd expect to see some strong dollar gains. We'd expect to see the dollar gains, the dollar push higher, that will push 
the euro US dollar lower and a, a higher that will also push the pound US dollar lower and the New Zealand US dollar lower. So what happens with the PMI data is going to be important. Now, if the PMI data is a disappointment, say it comes in like, you know, below 56, below 55, that will mean that the, um, that the data is a, is a big disappointment and that will mean that the bullishness of the FOMC may be not so warranted and maybe the dollar will see some further weakening. In which case, we'd expect more upside in the pound and more upside in the New Zealand US dollar. A good long on a weak data point later on will be a New Zealand US dollar upside. You can see here, we've had a break of that trend line. That's a probable trend change. And if we see a more hawkish reaction here, then we're expecting further upside in the pair. The RBNZ have tapered their bond purchases last week on the 23rd of July. And the expectations, the four largest investment banks in New Zealand now see the RBNZ raising interest rates this month, can you believe it? So there is a bias to buy the New Zealand US dollar, but all we need is a weak dollar story, and then that New Zealand upside US dollar can make sense. So dollar index at that key level, that will also impact the US 10-year yields. Now, you can see here with US 10-year yields, they're continuing to find buyers, okay? Now, those buyers coming into US 10-year yields is meaning that real yields fall, and that's been supporting gold. Let me explain something to you. Here's gold prices here. And you can see that gold prices have tried to break out of that uh, trend line on the daily chart, and they've just pulled lower, okay? Back down towards that support. Now, why did gold break out? It was after Jerome Powell was sort of more, he wasn't dovish, but he was just more in a holding position and certainly there wasn't any bullish surprise. So I'll show you what's driving gold and then you will now understand all the drivers in gold. Now look at this. This is an overlay chart of real yields, the dollar index and gold. Now, first of all, let me show you, let me piece this all together for you. The yellow dotted line is the real yields, okay? And you can see that the, the tips here roughly tracks real yields. So as a proxy for real yields, we're using the bond tips, which is the US uh, Treasury uh, real yield, essentially. And we're using that as a proxy. Now, what you'll notice is this. When real yields fall, see real yields for gold rises. Falling real yields, rising gold. Falling real yields, rising gold. Do you see that? When real yields fall, gold rises. Now, what are real yields? That is the nominal bond yield minus inflation expectations. So the nominal bond yield is the US 10-year yields. So you see the 10-year yields have been falling, but what's been rising? Inflation. So that means that a, a nominal bond, a real yield is when you take the yield of the bond, 1.21, and you minus from that inflation expectations. Now that means that the real yield of that bond is actually negative. So now when we go back to see uh, what's going on, we can see that the actual real yield of the US Treasury is minus 1.87. So when you factor in inflation, you can see that real yields are falling. That makes gold more attractive to hold. Now there's a couple of things to notice here. When real yields fell June last year, gold surged. When real yields fall in April this year, gold surged. Now you might say to yourself, well, look, I can see real yields are falling, but why is gold not surging? Why is gold not reaching that 1900, that 2040 region that it did in June last year and April this year? Well, that's because of the dollar. Look at the dollar. Can you see when real yields were falling in June, so too was the dollar. When real yields were falling in April, so too was the dollar. Now look what's been happening here. Real yields have been falling, but the dollars remain strong. So guess what's going to happen if the dollar falls? Yes, gold's going to push higher. So this is a potentially great long. Now, there's also very strong seasonals for gold in August. And that's due to the giving of traditional uh, gifts for the Asian wedding system, uh, Asian wedding season of gold. Okay, obviously in the 
not obviously, but for those of you who don't know, in the uh, Near East and the Far East, it's much more traditional to give a purer form of gold as a store of value for a gift. So around the Chinese Lunar New Year, uh, there's, a, a, there's a, a, a traditional exchange of gold gifts, similarly in the Asian wedding season. It's a kind of a, a form of endowment, a form of um, you know, financial gift to the recipient. Uh, that's also a store of value. In the West, people tend to use uh, gold more as jewellery and the gold tends to be a lower quality. Um, in the Near East, Far East, gold is given as a store of value and the quality tends to be a lot higher. It's much superior in its purity because of the purpose for which it's given. Now, gold here, you see it's breaking above that trend line and as if the real yields keep falling and if, crucially, the dollar falls. So, if later on today, if we get the ISM coming in very low, 58, and then we start getting ADP coming in low, if that starts being a disappointment coming in, you know, like, you know, 200, 300, or 400,000 on Wednesday, then that would be, should be some good support for gold. Okay? So you can see gold going above this trend line. Now, I am long. But I am long gold, and I realize that if the dollar's outlook changes, this, this trade will change as well. So I'm a little bit speculative here, but I love the technicals. Look at the way that gold is just edging up against that trend line. As long as we stay above, I'm expecting more gold upside. If you have a look at it on uh, another way, you can see that that 100, 200 exponential moving average on a daily chart is holding we can see that gold's trying to break above that trend line. So all of that really does um, mean that more, I'm expecting more gold upside technically, but I do need the fundamentals to really come firmly in line, which is the dollar start tracking the 10 year yields lower. If the dollar and the 10 year yields start moving lower, then I would expect gold to retest back up to that 1900 region. Okay, so that's a key element to look at and what we want to see for that to come uh, good is weak data prints for the US dollar. Why is that important? Because if we get weak data for the US dollar, it means that the, the Fed don't have to move. That support around that 91, 92 region should keep falling lower, maybe that down towards that 90 region. So that's what we need to see at the moment. And that would also help the pound and the New Zealand US dollar upside. Now, let's look at the RBA rate statement coming up. You can see here RBA is meeting overnight Tuesday, uh, um, very early Tuesday morning. Okay, so this is significant RBA rate statement. Now, the Reserve Bank of Australia, and this is one of our partners who um, I provide a lot of analysis for, and we partner up with HYCM because we want to offer you guys a great uh, job and a great service and what we do here is we just want to notice a few things so first of all notice that cases are really rising in australia and there's two problems that australia is facing number one covid19 cases are rising number two the vaccination level is low for australia look at this can you see australia's vaccination level only 14 percent have been double vaccinated. Now, this is my blog, and you can follow along my blog day by day as I um, keep traders informed with what's going on. I'll just put that in the chat box, and you can follow my blog here. But one point that I really uh, draw to our attention is this outlook from Australia with 14% of double vaccinated. So that's quite a lower level. And what that means is that the Australian economy has to try to contain the very spreading Delta variant. You see in Australia, cases are going much higher back towards the sort of previous peak levels. Now that's bad news for the Australian dollar. So will they, will the RBA when they meet, will they cancel their bond tapering? What they might say is that we're not gonna taper bond purchases, we're gonna extend bond purchases. So the outlook for the Australian dollar could be some significant downside. Now, one particular currency pair that I really like is the Australian dollar CAD. Now, I've been selling this since last week, and 
you can see, look at the diverging outlook. Canada has nearly double vaccinated 60% of the population. So they're going to be following the United Kingdom's approach of living with COVID-19. Australia are having to still contain COVID-19. So there's a different outlook from countries. Now, if we take a look at the Australian dollar CAD pair, what we can see on the monthly chart is that there is a bearish engulfing bar rejecting that key support level. So that support turned resistance. I'd expect to find sellers back at that 0.9240 region. And if the RBA are bearish, we'd be looking for selling back down towards that 0.900 region. So top taking profit 0.9015 makes sense. You can just see here that the, the, the pairs turning over, we can see momentum uh, starting to break and turn to the downside, bearish engulfing bar, rejecting that key resistance level, and price is making its way back down to that 0.9050, uh, 90, 100 region. So definitely one to watch. And we would need to see a bearish RBA tonight. So this is what to look for specifically. Oh yeah, also a couple of other things to notice. Notice that the Australian dollar tends to be weak in August. It's one of the weakest uh, months of the year for the Australian dollar. It tends to lose value in August. Also, uh, the biggest export for Australia is iron ore. These are the 2019 OEC export data. And you can see, look, iron ore is Australia's biggest export. Now, nearly one quarter of all Australian exports is iron ore. Of that one quarter, 80% go directly to China. Now, have a look here. What do you notice about iron ore prices? Well, you see, last week, iron ore prices fell sharply lower. Why? Because China has said that they're going to limit some of the steel production which uses iron ore in China. Now, steel production uses iron ore and it contributes towards 15% of China's emission of climate altering gases. So the burning of fossil fuels and the production of steel is not very good from an environmental perspective. So China wants to cut back on it. That means they're going to need less iron ore. So iron ore prices are falling on expectations of lower demand going forward. That's why I remember 80% of all Australia's iron ore exports as of 2019 were going to China. So that means but that's another pressure on the Australian dollar. So as the RBA meet, they've got rising COVID-19 cases, they've got a low vaccination rate, the Australian dollar is weak during August, iron ore exports are going to be hit because the green, um, China's drive to lower emissions is lowering iron ore prices. So this is what to look for. If we see the RBA, they plan tapering in September, and if they carry on tapering, then expect the Australian dollar to, 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 to rise. If they ignore all of these headwinds and say things are fine, then expect the Australian dollar to, to rise. However, this is what I'm expecting, that they will announce that maybe tapering is no longer going to take place. They could also announce that quantitative easing purchases are going to increase to $6 billion per week. And they might explain the virus situation as pushback normalization plans. All of those are potential outcomes for the Australian dollar. And that could result in a lot of Australian dollar weakness, in which case, Australian dollar CAD weakness makes sense. Okay, that would be a great sell at market. Now, some traders could, I am selling this from last week, so I'm, I'm in profit despite the retracement at the moment. So I'll be moving my stock to break even. Uh, other options are to sell, but stops need to be run pretty tight. So in other words, you could, uh, if you're going to bed before the RBA, you could sell and just keep a wide stop. But remember that your stock could be stopped out because if the RBA 
do surprise markets, then this will retrace significantly higher, okay? The other option is to wait for the event, and if the RBA are more dovish than expected, then we could look to potentially sell this at market and looking for a move down to 0 0.9020, 0 0.9015, okay? So a bearish RBA, we'd also expect the Bank of Canada to be more hawkish going forward, so there is a divergence between the two. So Aussie CAD shorts, I think are very attractive and certainly worth looking at. Similarly, let's take a look at the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar. The RBA and the RBNZ also have a very different outlook. The RBNZ are looking at potentially, uh, it's rumoured they may be raising interest rates this month. So there is a bias to sell the Australian dollar and New Zealand dollar as well. So just looking out for that, um, again, it will be a bearish RBA, which would be an ability to sell Aussie New Zealand dollar at market. Again, we can see a bit of a negative push to the downside. I think on a monthly chart, you can see that momentum is starting to pull uh, to the downside. So that, again, you know, selling at market, uh, with stops just above that 1.07512, looking for a move back down to that 1.0300 region makes sense. Um, as long as the divergent outlook remains between RBA and the RBNZ, uh, always take a look at my blog, and I have got a look at that uh, outlook in significant detail. Um, and you can see here from last week, I outlined that Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar. Um, diverging outlook, and you can see what the diverging outlook is. You can see the bond yield spread, which is a great tool to use. This is the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar bond yield spread. And essentially, what the bond yield spread does is hit there in the yellow line. It just shows you the, the diverging yield in the, the bonds. Now, FX traders care about bond yields because it's all to do with interest rates. When Yields are rising, that means uh, traders are bond traders are expecting interest rates to rise. So in a very simple form, the bond yield spread is a good risk profile for currencies. So do you see how the price tracks the bond yield spread? So as the bond yield spread moves lower, so do does price. If the bond yield spread moves higher, so do does price, okay? So a falling 10-year Aussie New Zealand 10-year bond yield should be matched with a falling price. Sometimes the two diverge. Uh, so you can see here, price was falling lower even when the bond yield spread was moving higher. But once the bond yield spread started moving lower, again, you can see price moving. So the bond yield spread signals lower prices in Aussie two to 10 year, New Zealand 10 year. So look at this for the RBA later. I hope that makes sense. Um, there's definitely some potential opportunities uh, there uh, coming up for the session. Uh, so we've looked at gold, we've looked at Australian dollar. Now the next big event to be looking for, New Zealand employment data. If that is strong and, and the RBA are dovish, expect that Australian New Zealand dollar downside to really accelerate lower. Okay? So I would quite like, if, that, if the RBA are dovish, Selling Australian dollar at market makes sense. And then if that New Zealand employment uh, disappoints, there could still be a selling a, week, selling a rally higher as well. Uh, US dollar ADP number. Remember the ADP data is used to set the mood for Friday, the non-farm payroll. Now, the ADP data doesn't track the non-farm payroll very accurately at all. But there's still a bit of a feel in the market that Wednesday's data sets the mood music. So if this is a big disappointment, it will set up Friday for a disappointment. Disappointment in the dollar will mean dollar weakness, upside New Zealand US dollar, upside pound US dollar. So look out for that. Going into Thursday further, we have the Bank of England meeting. Now, what am I expecting? I'm expecting the Bank of England to be pretty neutral. Now, we've had two Monetary Policy Committee members, Saunders and Ramsden, 
who have become more hawkish. But there's not enough. Remember, look, there's nine members. Only two of them are hawkish. It's not enough to maybe make the Bank of England totally hawkish. If there is a hawkish surprise, this is the currency pair that I'm really interested in. It's the pound yen long. Now, if you look at the pound yen long here, this is the monthly chart, you can see that we have a false break of an inside bar. Now, that is a Harami inside bar, false break of a Harami inside bar, and it really does signal higher prices. You can see here, you had a false break of a Harami inside bar, and prices moved up from 132 to 155, so a couple of thousand points. Okay, we had a false break of a Harami inside bar. Let's see if we have another example on the chart. Technically, here we have, uh, that's a nearly Harami inside bar, but you have a false break nearly of a, of a nearly Harami inside bar, and you have another few thousand point move. So these false break patterns are important. You can see it's rejecting that 200 exponential moving average, really signaling higher prices here in the pound yen on a higher time frame, and it's looking for a retest back to that 160 region potentially. So if the Bank of England are hawkish, a pound yen long makes sense. You can enter up market, stops below the 147, looking for a retest of 160, but we need a hawkish Bank of England for that to be true, okay? Now, I'm not expecting the Bank of England to be hawkish. The last meetings they've had, and you can go along to my blog, look at the Central Bank Watch, you can see that the, 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 reserve, the Bank of England tends to be quite cautious, quite, quite uh, you know, slow to act. So you can see here that at the last uh, meeting, I put an abundance of caution. So they, they, wrote, they, they revised up growth, they revised up inflation, but yet they kept a very neutral tone. So remember this, um, the Bank of England is a source of confusion as they've revised up both growth and inflation, but still don't give any reasons for bulls to take the gap higher. So I was looking, going longer, pound yen, around the end of June, uh, and you can see the price has just sat under that 154 region. We have since had that big retrace. But this trend line, if that can break higher, can you see here, that trend line here, here, if that breaks higher, that will uh, be potentially very violent, uh, looking for a move up to 160 and potentially beyond. So technically, there's a lot of nice things about the pound yen, but we need to see a bullish Bank of England, and we need to see risk sentiment improve. So we don't want to see investors worried about anything. We want to see the VIX moving lower. The VIX is here. Now this is the volatility index. We want to see that volatility index moving lower. Now let me show you what happens. When the uh, VIX moves lower, let me just put the S&P 500 on here. Right. So if we go to the daily chart, you'll see that, do you see here, when the VIX rises, volatility S&P 500 falls. Rising VIX, falling S&P 500. Rising VIX, falling S&P 500. Rising VIX, falling S&P 500. So the vice versa is true as well. Falling VIX, rising S&P 500. Falling VIX, rising S&P. We want to see the VIX fall. Back down 1750, belief set 16, back down towards that 15 region. That will help equity markets keep moving. That will keep risk sentiment positive. That will keep the yen weak. So that's what we want to see. We want to see yen weakness, and, the, and we want to see the pound yen pushing higher. So Bank of England meeting will be absolutely crucial, and that will be coming up on Thursday. Friday, Governor Lowe is speaking. So look out for anything that happens on Tuesday. The statement. Look for that being further clarified by Lowe on Friday. So that can move markets. Also. We can see markets moving with the um, US dollar NFP and also Canadian employment data. So if employment data comes in strong, expect the CAD to rally hard. And one thing I'm potentially looking at is that Aussie CAD short. So if you are short Aussie CAD, that could be a good opportunity to further see gains if the RBA are dovish. Then on Friday, we have the US dollar uh, data point. Now what we want to look for is unemployment rate. We want the unemployment rate to, to fall. We want the non-farm employment a headline figure to rise higher and we want to see the participation rate up so rising participation rate falling unemployment strong employment that will result in dollar strength if that's a miss 
say the data comes in at like 700,000, say the unemployment moves up to 6%, um, and remember that the job furlough scheme is still in place, it doesn't end until September time in the US. So not expecting good, necessarily, amazing uh, labor numbers yet. So if they do come, that will be a big bullish surprise. If they don't come, then that should be more US dollar weakness. So you can see it's a big week for the US dollar and a big week for US 10 year yields. And that's likely to impact gold significantly alongside the US dollar and the major pairs. Okay, folks, uh, that's the main event. Oh, good question, Sarah. Is it the same for US dollar and bond yields? Very similar, okay? So if we just overlay here the dollar index, you'll see. You can see that the pathway in the US 10 year yields was matched by strength in the US dollar. We then saw a little bit of weakness in 10 year yields, the weakness in the dollar. We saw a little bit of a divergence here with the dollar strengthening, but 10 year yields falling. Now, this era was a bit of a confusion in the markets because the markets were going, well, why are the 10 year yields moving lower? And the reasons given for that was to do with uh, some uh, positioning. There was also a lot of Japan, a large Japan, Japanese pension fund ended up. Um, getting rid of some of its US Treasury holdings. So it shifted its allocation of about 47% down to about 35%. So there was quite a lot of 10-year um, US Treasuries that were gotten rid of around the start of the year, heading into the financial year end for Japan. So there's been a bit of a retracement, there's been a bit, a bit of a bid into bonds, but markets have been saying, well, they don't understand this. Now, where will yields be in six months' time? Most economists think it'll be closer to two than it will be to 0.7. So this dip low is expecting to find buyers at one stage. So that's why we've seen the US dollar strengthen, and you can see here that dollar strengthened out of the June FOMC when the dot plot projection rate changed. So the question is, what's going to move? Is the US dollar going to move lower in line with the bond market or is the bond yields going to move higher in line with the dollar so we'll have to see my hunch is that 10-year yields should be closer to two than they should be to 0.7 because are the fed going to taper yes either at jackson hole end of august or september and are they going to uh, raise interest rates well yes so i see a path to us normalization is on the way i think it'll only take one good jobs report and then we should see US 10 yields moving higher. But notice, Sarah, we haven't been seeing this. And that's been weird. Uh, the best way to express this in terms of a trade opportunity will be through the US dollar Japanese yen. Now, I'm medium term, I'm bullish US dollar Japanese yen. Look here, do you see how the 10 year yields, the US dollar Japanese yen tracks the US dollar 10 year yields? Rising 10 year yields, rising US dollar Japanese yen. Falling US 10 year yields, falling dollar US dollar Japanese yen. Rising US dollar Japanese yen here, but weird, falling US 10 year yields. Now, these two should be moving more together. And I'm expecting a good jobs data point. If that comes out eventually, either next month or the month after, then I expect 10 year yields start moving higher and the dollar yen to move higher as well. So this is a medium term trade. I would only enter this like from 108, but if it in price moves to 108, that is also a decent weekly trend line. So see price move back down there, I can see what buying and stops can be very tight, just underneath 107. So buying at 108, stops around, you know, just underneath 107 and potentially looking for a move back up to 112. So that's what I'm looking at, Sarah. But you you raise a good point. Um yeah. Yeah, Sarah, no, that's great. Um, the tricky bit is with the uh, US dollar at the moment is the US 10 year yields. It's surprising people why it keeps um, finding bids into US 10 year yield bonds. So some people are saying, look, that 
in, because inflation is not going to be a, such a bigger concern now that that, t that rates are going to remain lower for longer than people are expecting. So that's why there's bids into bonds. So that's one view. The main economist's view is that this is going to be moving up to 1.8, 1.2. Now we have to see, Sarah, because obviously, you know, none of us have a crystal ball, um, but it's raising eyebrows. Now, technically, can you see that trend line that I put in there? Technically, it made sense to find buyers. I think I mean, as long as that low holds, that's fine. Uh, that's just a pullback in bond sellers. OK, so I would expect to find bonds being sold again. That's yields moving higher from this point. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not trading it. And it, it's not to say that price can't move back down to 0 0.7, 0 0.8. But that would, that would be a surprise. Eventually, I'm expecting yields to, to move back up towards two rather than 0.7. Um, so just to be just being aware of what the you know the the narratives are uh, does help. Um, I hope I hope some of that helps, Sarah. Yeah. Okay. Soup. Yeah. Yeah. Good, Sarah. That's excellent. Very good, folks. Don't forget, I'm back here on Wednesday. And let's just move over to the. Yeah, don't forget back here on Wednesday, same time, 12.30 UK, uh, 12.30 to 1.30 PM GMT time. Um, and we'll be looking at individual currency pairs trade. We'll go through the RBA meeting. I'll explain what has happened and the significance. We'll go through Aussie CAD, we'll go through Aussie New Zealand dollar, and we'll get ourselves completely ready for the Bank of England. So do come on Wednesday. It'll be well worth your time. And we'll also look at what's been happening with the US dollar, with the data points that we've had so far, and just get ready for the ADP data. Okay, folks, thank you all very much. Take care. Have a very good afternoon. Thank you now. Goodbye.